We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. We are short one Amanda today. She wasn't (laughs) feeling well. I won't start singing the song I always sing. (laughs) And cue the music. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. This season we are covering Nadia Bakes, as you very well know if you've been listening all along, where Nadia Hussein returns to baking her happy place and spotlights creative kindred spirits. But... Before we discuss what Nadia has been baking or not baking, let's discuss <laughs> what we've been cooking slash eating slash getting up to in the kitchen. Meg, how's it going with you? Yeah, it's going pretty good. I am eating more than just potatoes, so already off to a Woo! good start. <laughs> what I've been up to is that I wandered into a little local grocery store that once I went inside, I discovered that it has a lot of imported goods and particularly imported foods from various European countries. So Mm. even though I wasn't seeking it out, I did find a jar of lemon lime marmalade. (laughs) The universe presented it to you. Exactly. I feel like it was meant to be. So I was Mm -hmm. like, well, the universe brought me this weird lime marmalade, so I have to buy it. (laughs) So I now have all the ingredients to make Nadia's lime croissant pudding thing if I feel so inclined. <laughs> Did you taste the the marmalade at all yet? I haven't tasted it yet. It is lemon lime, whereas what she used in the show was just lime. So it looks a little bit different. The color is a little bit darker than I thought it was going to be, but I have yet to discover if it has the jello consistency or not. <laughs> Ugh, it's so disturbing. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it's something on Ghostbusters. <laughs> Yeah, very ectoplasmy. <laughs> but also at that same grocery store, I found a tube of sun-dried tomato polenta. And that was really, really yummy. So I cooked up some slices of polenta in a pan and served it with oh. some fresh basil and mozzarella and tomatoes. And it was really good. That's delicious. Yeah. I love those tubes of polenta. You can just get those at Trader Joe's, but like a flavored one? Ooh. Yeah, they had sun-dried tomato and they had just Italian herb. It was kind of vague, but it said Italian herb. And I thought, well, I'm sure that's good too. But I only tried the sun-dried tomato. Sounds yum. Yeah, I love good. it. What about you, Justine? Some news. <laughs> <laughs> If you have been paying attention to words I've been saying over the past podcast times, I have sometimes mentioned I can't eat some things or I have to like give up gluten again, like that sort of thing. So basically, TLDR, for the past year I've been sick. No big deal though. No worries. I have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's autoimmune disease. And for those who don't know, it's just a a problem with my thyroid. But what this means is that sometimes I develop food sensitivities and other things like that. So I have to have a much more strict diet than I did previously just being vegan. That's it. (laughs) So insert sad trombone sound effect here in post. (laughs) Yeah. Another thing that may affect me, sometimes I have brain fog. It's a, it's a symptom, which is also not great for a podcaster. Just like the other day doing notes on this, I couldn't remember the word for pan. <laughs> like... Brain fog, not great for anybody. <laughs> yeah, I know. So just bear with me. I am hopeful, personally, that I'm going to like kick butt over the next year and a half and go into complete remission. That's my goal. It was caught early. I'm fine. I just, the better I do with my diet and not cheat, the faster I will heal and be fully recovered. That's it. On the other hand, I did make a cheesecake. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the cheesecake had everything I, I could eat it, you know. But it also didn't turn out good. So, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I just feel bad all around for you. And I hope that you feel better soon and can eat all the foods you want also soon. Thank you. And not bad cheesecakes. (laughs) (laughs) It's fine. It just didn't, mm, it just didn't come out as advertised, you know, via the recipe. Mm -hmm. It was, um, 
refrigerator cheesecake that's made with um, pretty much you soak your cashews, grind them up, add like coconut, milk, solid, you know, that part, other things, and then also strawberries in there. The thing was, it just didn't come out smooth. It just mm. came out still like grainy. And then also it didn't quite solidify. So in the fridge, it was kind of like pudding cheesecake. But <laughs> if you put it in the freezer, then it's ice cream cheesecake. So it's edible, but eh, it's not what... Eh. <laughs> Gritty pudding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it tastes, but the flavor was good. <laughs> well, that's good. It definitely has something to compare it to when I probably make the next cheesecake coming up, aka one of Nadia's dishes. Oh, possibly. is this a sneak preview of the potluck? Possibly. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> you tipped your hand. <laughs> oh, come on. Everybody knew. They're like, ah, the vegan dish. We've got another vegan dish in this episode. It's true. Spoiler alert. I can't eat sesame <laughs> or tahini. Sad. Uh, I know. Oh, that, it's the worst. Giving up tahini as a vegan is the worst thing that has happened to me. It's not the worst thing ever. I'm being dramatic. I'm being I was going to say, wow, charmed life. <laughs> I'm being so dramatic right now. It's cool. We're going to move on to talking about <laughs> the shows today. <laughs> we got two episodes on the menu today. Uh, Biscuits and Bites and Celebration Bakes. The first episode, episode seven, Biscuits and Bites. <laughs> <laughs> Which Justine is obligated to say it that way for some reason. Obviously. The Netflix description is perfect in a pinch. Raspberry Amaretti biscuits, Florentine, Lebanese diamonds, and chicken donuts. Then visit Lungi Malanga of Treats Club. I hate these descriptions. These descriptions so are terrible. Okay, I'm going to put on my writerly cap for a while. It really annoys me that these sentences don't follow parallel construction in any way. It's one of those things where it's kind of hard to put your finger on why something sounds weird but these are just all over the place the type of sentences they are the sentence structure is just so incongruent that it's very annoying Mm, talk grammar to me meg (laughs) (laughs) the first one's not even quite a complete sentence (laughs) it's it's bad it's bad i don't know who's in charge of the copy here but they bad Bad. <laughs> so we can start this episode by talking about raspberry amaretti biscuits. These looked very pretty. Mm-hmm. I thought that they looked, I was going to say easy to make, but it does start with making a meringue, which is maybe not the easiest thing. It's a little bit finicky. But yeah. I think once you get past the meringue, they might be not too bad to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that they're cool they look good and um yeah i'm definitely all down for yeah i definitely see these at christmas they're all on my pinterest board at christmas time (laughs) whenever i've made cookies like this the powdered sugar for me on the outside like melts i never get like a good coating so maybe next time in the future when i make these i can follow because she had a big bowl and she was just like yeah powdered sugar (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, because the powdered sugar covered cookies I've made or eaten around Christmas time, I think they put the powdered sugar on after it comes out of the oven. I don't think I've ever made a cookie where the powdered sugar is applied before baking, which I mean, what you said makes sense. I would imagine that it would maybe melt or cook off a little bit. So yeah, maybe the trick is just putting a lot of powdered sugar. On a lot, it. like a good wall of powdered sugar. Maybe it was a rather low heat. I don't really pay attention to the heat measurements in these episodes because it's, you know, not Fahrenheit. So it kind of goes over my head and I don't take note of it. But maybe it was a low heat for longer or something like that. It's true. Yeah. There's a lot of sugar in this as well. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I like when whenever she dumps bowls of sugar, she starts out with like a little like trail of it and then she just tips the whole bowl. (laughs) (laughs) all the sugar i like because you when you think she's like oh it's not so much la 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 dump (laughs) (laughs) 
They just wanted it to look pretty at first before dumping it all in. <laughs> I like that she says that if she can make something pink, she will. And she makes the dough pink here with free- freeze-dried raspberries. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, oh, that's a I good idea. I think that's an excellent tip. I love that because normally these cookies do use food dye. Mm. And if you don't want to use food dye, I love this freeze-dried raspberries crushed up into the dough. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think if you wanted it even finer, you could probably run it through your spice grinder or something and have a nice fine powder. But yeah, it's a really clever way to get a pretty pink dough. And it Mm -hmm. adds flavor. Yeah. I thought about you when she was folding the the sugar into the meringue. (laughs) Why? Because of folding on a Schitt's Creek. (laughs) (laughs) You fold in the cheese. You fold it in. (laughs) Classic. Classic. I think that they're good. I think that they're classic. And you're right. I think they could be easy if you are slam dunk at making a meringue. Yes. Because if you mess that up, you know, you pretty much have to start over from the beginning and that could be annoying but yeah i love almond i love raspberries they were very very gorgeous to look at i liked these yeah i give it an a (laughs) (laughs) next treat though chicken donuts (laughs) chicken donuts yes you heard that right as she said (laughs) so uh not baking not baking (laughs) She didn't know that that we would have her at her word of the name of the show. (laughs) (laughs) In this episode, though, for this recipe, she does acknowledge that she's not baking them. Unlike in the previous episode where she just went ahead and fried stuff without even commenting on it. She said, yes, technically you could bake these, but you wouldn't get the consistency that you want, the desired consistency of that fried, crunchy outside and the doughy, airy, soft inside. And she Mm -hmm. basically says, yeah, I'm frying it because that's the only way to do it. Well, if you steam them, are they a bao? These looked like bao, for sure. Mm -hmm. That was definitely one of my first impressions. I'm like, these look like dumplings. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to talk about (laughs) the chicken filling. Mm -hmm. So it's... Shredded cooked chicken and chives, barbecue sauce, mayo, and chili flakes. Mm -hmm. So it's like donut stuff with chicken salad. (laughs) Yeah, when she said she was putting barbecue chicken in it, I expected a lot more barbecue sauce or barbecue flavorings compared to mayo. I wasn't expecting mayo at all. And then (laughs) I feel like it was mostly mayo with like a drop of barbecue sauce. Yeah. I think it would have been better, more barbecue heavy. I do like a good chicken salad, but I don't think I want a chicken salad donut. (laughs) But what else can we stuff donuts with? I mean, pretty much anything, right? Anything fried is good, pretty much. (laughs) As long as you deep fry it, it's probably going to taste all right. Potato salad. (laughs) (laughs) Why you got to mention potatoes? I'm sorry. <laughs> Ooh, but yeah, actually, now that you say that, maybe like a sort of samosa type filling in a mm-hmm. donut, that'd be good. That'd be so good. Yeah. <laughs> so that's potato and peas, basically. Yeah. In a donut. It's a good idea, Nadia, to have a savory donut. With the savory dust. Dust. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever find the word dust appetizing, but I like the way she says it. (laughs) What? I'm just like, what is this? But also, yes. I'd eat it, except for the fact that I've eaten vegetarian for a year now. But that notwithstanding, I would eat it. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that Nadia is like, we just make stuff in our house. It just happens. Here you go. Yeah, she says that she likes going for unconventional flavors and this is one of the recipes she considers unconventional so i do think once you start thinking outside the box a little bit it can produce pretty interesting recipes yeah it reminds me of uh indianish a bit yeah use your imagination have fun i like it (laughs) all right so in the episode it segued nice into the donut stall there but we're going to talk about that after yes 
and go on to the vegan friendly. Mm -hmm. It's a friend to vegans. Is, is, that's what that fr phrase means. <laughs> <laughs> Turmeric and ginger diamonds. I thought this looked really good. It was a tray bake. Of all of her recipes she's made in this episode particularly, but maybe ever, this one looks really easy. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of dumping everything into the same pan. There's not a lot to it as far as ingredients go. And except for the stem ginger, which I feel like is something we don't really have in the U.S. Yeah. It, I, I feel like except that? for that, the ingredients are pretty easy to get your hands on. Stem ginger in syrup. Yes, the in syrup part. I suppose we could get, you know, a ginger root and maybe grate it into this recipe, but you wouldn't get the syrup that you need for the topping. So I'm not sure what us Americans would do <laughs> without stem ginger. Yeah, but I agree. I like this take on a Lebanese dessert. I like all of the flavors of that region, the turmeric, the ginger. Mm -hmm. When she said her mom was like, what are you putting that in a cake? I was just like, yeah. <laughs> this is interesting back to back with the chicken donuts, because I do think that is something she considers unconventional that she does a lot is taking things that are typically savory and putting them in something sweet. So in the case of this, her mom would have said like, oh, turmeric is something you use for something savory. And she's like, oh, no, I'm going to put it in a sweet dish. Whereas like chicken is obviously also usually savory and she's going to make a donut out of it. So I do think this is a flavor switcheroo that she likes to play with a lot. This is like an anti-inflammatories dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Turmeric, ginger. So in the recipe to make it vegan, she just uses water and olive oil instead of milk and eggs. Olive oil cakes are tasty. They're mm -hmm. always very moist in my experience. I think yeah. this sounds good. They're a thing. I like that there's interesting pine nuts on top. Mm-hmm. Oh, this thing wants to be hummus so bad, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hummus bars doesn't sound quite as oh, good. <laughs> it does to me. As someone who hasn't been able to eat hummus in the past year. Mm. <laughs> okay, I got to ask, have you had chocolate hummus? Because this, this is something I can't wrap my head around. I've seen it. I have not tried it. See, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> what do you eat it with? Is it? It's just a dessert, right? I don't, I don't. You're not dipping carrots in there. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down that cake looks like it's giving birth in the oven. <laughs> Why did you write that? I don't know. It's because the time lapse, the cake looked like it was breathing the way it was going like up and down. So it had like a <laughs> A big stomach and then a little stomach. <laughs> it went to that beach that makes you old. Yes. <laughs> That's what that oven is. <laughs> <laughs> I like these. Once I'm able to have sesame again, I will make this for sure. Well, I do feel like you could make this without the sesame seeds. She does brush the baking tray with tahini mm -hmm. and she does use enough that that would definitely impart flavor into the final dish but i think you could you know grease the pan with something else and then don't put the sesame seeds as garnish garnish on top but it might not be as good yeah no you're right and i did think about that it wouldn't be the full experience but it would be like enough <laughs> right. Enough, as the French say. <laughs> the certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> was that this episode? The shirt she was wearing? Yes. Next up, then, of our last biscuit and bite are ginger and almond Florentines, which I know, maybe we all know, from Jabibo. <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan. I've looked, I, since Jabibo, I have looked up vegan Florentine recipes on Pinterest. I haven't made them at this juncture, but they are possible, BT dubs. <laughs> <laughs> I do think these look good. These are a type of dessert where I don't know if I'd be very motivated to make them myself. Like, 
I've never sat down and thought, oh, man, I could really go for some Florentines right now. (laughs) They're just, you know, a little bit fancy, a little bit classy. And, you know, I would expect maybe to be served these at baby shower or something like that. I feel like it's something you make to impress to have a pretty looking little cookie that maybe puts looks over taste. Since they have a lot of ginger in them, I see them in the the fall winter range of cookie. Mm -hmm. She did describe it as similar to a ginger snap, which I feel is a very fall cookie. I almost said it's almost fall, but I don't know if that's true, really. (laughs) I Uh, wish it was almost fall. Yeah. Bring on that Halloween stuff. Yes. Oh, God. Let's see. Melted butter, brown sugar, golden syrup, crystallized ginger, almonds, all melted in Mm a pan. Remember? I couldn't remember. (laughs) That word. I wrote all in the dish. (laughs) (laughs) What I like about this is that it's very caramely almost you definitely have the caramelized sugar Mm -hmm. to me it's approaching sort of like toffee territory or maybe like peanut brittle territory but almonds instead of peanuts obviously it's not as crunchy as toffee or brittle it still has that nice chew to it Mm -hmm. but I do like all of those things and I like a caramely cookie would they stick to your teeth I think if they were made well and made by Nadia, they would not stick to your teeth. <laughs> I feel that. I love the spread. I like that they come out like see-through. I think that they're pretty. Mm-hmm. That's why it also feels more like a caramel or like a toffee or a brittle to me, because it does have that different sort of translucent quality in a way. And then she dips them in chocolate. Like she said, normally they have a full chocolate back to them. Mm-hmm. But she likes a dip. It was a nice little dip technique. The marbling was very pretty. I gave it a B. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go through and assign grades to all the recipes. I don't know why I'm grading today. <laughs> okay, let's swing on back to that donut stall. Lungi Malanga's donut stall. Fresh donuts a la carte. Made for you. A 26-hour donut. Personalized just for you. <laughs> We had mentioned in previous episodes that we felt some of the special guests were kind of shoehorned into the theme of the episode, but this one was definitely better because, like you said, there was the easy transition from donuts to more donuts, so I felt like it was incorporated better. I liked that we got to see her shop just because it looked really cute. It looked like this little pop-up store. It was all pink and had those nice string lights and things like that. It just looked like a very fun little place to get a donut. I don't know if I would really like the donut that she made for the episode, but it looked like a good base donut and I bet it would be delicious, but it was just one of those donuts where it's like, ah, there's too much going on. There's too much. I uh, feel the opposite. (laughs) (laughs) Every time she added something, I wrote like, mmm, chocolate glaze, mmm, toasted marshmallow fluff. No, I'm on board for the marshmallow fluff, for sure. I think it was the cookie crumbles and the Oreo cookie where I felt like that was a bridge too far. Mm. But that's also just because I'm not really an Oreo fan. I am. <laughs> just like the the B-roll they were getting of the donuts, like, frying up and turning over. It was like beautiful porn shots, food porn. Mm. Yes, the show has good food porn. I do think the base donut looked very pretty. I thought that I would eat it. I would eat it. Absolutely. I love donuts. And also, she kept talking about the aroma of a donut frying and the smell of it. And she said that she's sure that everyone has memories of smelling donuts somewhere. I liked that, that focus on the aroma of it all, because it is a very distinct scent and it's like ah donuts (laughs) i wish i could smell this episode the aroma of a dunkin donuts i love dunkin donuts that's probably my favorite donut chain Mm -hmm. this episode was good i liked this one i think it was a step up from the last two (laughs) it was maybe more approachable ingredients wise for us folks across the pond well that's biscuits and bites and after we take a quick break we're coming back to celebrate with celebration bakes and we're back 
Celebration Bakes. The last episode of Nadia Bakes, the Netflix description is Nadia's Mardi Gras King Cake, Hot Cross Buns, and Festive Biscuit Tower are sure to please partygoers. Take in Nastasia's Luswango's Stylish Slices. The last episode. <laughs> the last episode, and it's a party. I will say right off the bat that I think these dishes are a bit more complicated and we don't get, I don't know, it seems like they go fast because it's the same time frame, but the dishes are more complicated. So that's what I feel about these. They do seem more complicated. I also feel at the same time, though, that I'm not as excited about eating them as I am about some of the other recipes. <laughs> I do like the concept of this for a final episode in the mm. series. I do think that the idea of making something for a special occasion, a celebration, as they call it, that's a good idea for ending with a bang, so to speak. Although I'm not sure if in execution it felt as big as it could have to me. It did remind me that uh, Kim Joy's new cookbook is Celebration Bakes. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So if you like, if you do like these kinds of bakes, Kim Joy's got a whole cookbook about stuff just like this. <laughs> yeah, I do have more to say on that, but it's mostly about the last recipe. So I'll put a pin in that for the moment. Gotcha. So let's jump into the first recipe. Honey cake. Honey cake. <laughs> I like honey. I like cake. Although, is this a cake? Question mark. Mm, n- n- no, none of these are cakes. <laughs> Non-cake cakes. Yeah, so the recipe name is cake, but the whole time she's making it, the individual layers she refers to as biscuit layers. So it's pretty much biscuits assembled to resemble a cake. <laughs> yeah, that was some like thick dough, like thick. Yes. Well, this was an interesting way to start off the recipe because... You know, I was expecting a batter because that's typically how you make a cake is with cake batter. So she makes a dough instead that is much more like a cookie dough, rolls it out, cuts it into rounds, and then cooks all these separate teeny layers. Yeah, very interesting. Cooking the layers separately and then piling them up with their sour cream frosting. I got confused also on that too. Because she was whipping the double cream and then she was like, and sour cream. And I'm like, which is which? Are you, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Even though she called it a sour cream filling, in the end, it did, to me, look like it was more just regular whipped cream with like a touch of sour cream. But I guess it's more interesting to call it sour cream filling. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. That's confused me. She takes the layers, eight layers. They're thin. Bake them. Bake the scraps, too, mm-hmm. and then pound the scraps into a crumb with hazelnuts. Mm-hmm. Make sure you make a lot of that because you're then covering the cake, not only in the, the whipped cream, sour cream frosting, but <laughs> in that crumb hazelnut topping as well. You're covering this cake completely. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, it sounded good to me. Like I said, I like honey. If it was a very honey forward flavor, I feel like I would enjoy that. I think the thing about a lot of these recipes in this episode is that I don't think I would undertake to make them myself. Mm -mm. Like this one looks very delicious. Am I going to make an eight layer cake? Probably not. (laughs) If someone were to make this for me for my birthday, I would be very, very happy about that. But yeah. Yeah. Not going to make this anytime soon, I don't think. It's 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 a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because Nadia said this is a Russian recipe. And I feel like I might have had, if not this exactly, then something similar before when I was visiting someone who had Russian parents. And they gave us this whole spread of baked goods I couldn't identify. <laughs> and oh, they were wow. all delicious. And I feel like this might have been part of it. Yeah, and then I think it's cool that she was named by a mysterious Russian man. (laughs) Her dad's mysterious Russian friend whom she's never met. Weird story, but I like it. Yeah. (laughs) I guess Nadia kind of sounds like a Russian name. It is. Yeah, it's a Russian name. Yeah. I think the spelling is different, but yeah. Yeah, it was pretty, but 
And also, I'm not quite sure how it would actually taste slash texture. What that I've seen is. some YouTube hacks, so to speak, of like how to make a cake in 15 minutes. And some of these hacks are taking a cookie and then doing essentially what Nadia does here is putting milk over the cookie and then frosting it. And then the cookie absorbs enough moisture that then when you cut it, its texture is more cake-like, is softer and moister than cookie-like. So I'm wondering if that is what happens with this recipe. Maybe the biscuit layers become moist and cakey because of the sour cream filling. I don't know. Soggy cookie. Yeah, it doesn't sound great. (laughs) Next up, the king cake. USA, USA. (laughs) She did it wrong, though. Okay, please go ahead, because I have thoughts as well, but I want to know if we had the same thoughts about what went wrong here. (laughs) Where's the baby? Where's the baby? (laughs) That is what I have written in my notes as well. Where's the baby? (laughs) You can't have a king cake without the baby. Guys, if you don't know, there's supposed to be a little bitty baby in there. (laughs) Everyone wants a choking hazard in their cakes. Right? (laughs) Little bitty baby. Supposed to be Jesus. Something, something. You get good luck. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Whoever gets the baby in their slice of cake that's a good thing. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I got the baby. I, got I will the baby. admit, I don't have much experience with king cakes. Neither do I. But also there's that terrifying uh, king cake baby mascot for that basketball team, <laughs> question mark. Also, that's a deep dive on the internet. If you want to see terrifying mascots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At first, I was really excited to talk about an American recipe. I'm like, finally, maybe we can be the ones who aren't confused by the recipe. (laughs) But yeah, I haven't eaten a lot of king cake. I've never made a king cake. So I really only have a little bit of Americanness to contribute to this recipe. (laughs) It seemed good, though. I mean, but it's bread dough, blah, 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 bread hook, spread it out. Prawling cream. (laughs) Prawling cream in the inside. I feel like if I were making this, I would have added more filling. I Mm. feel like there was too much bread to not enough filling. But that's just because I like a bunch of filling in my sticky buns or what have you. I think when she cut it, there were a lot of gaps. Yes, I got the impression that maybe it could have been rolled a bit tighter. But I don't know. Maybe that's the best that you can do. I got the impression that there was room for a baby. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That's why there were so many gaps. You need to fill them in with babies. (laughs) Everybody gets a baby. (laughs) I like the colored coconut shreds trick. That was a good trick. I do feel like she needed some purple coconut because I think every Mardi Gras king cake I've seen has green, yellow, and purple. So Mm. I feel like purple was missing. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's another um, recipe that I felt like it was a bit rushed. I do like Naughty is a big nerd and loves to measure things. <laughs> she is very excited about rulers and tape measures. Yeah. Like, get her rulers for Christmas. <laughs> Babyless king cake. <laughs> there it is. We demand more babies in the baked goods. Yeah. Moving on to something else. Hot cross buns. I don't know what they are. Also kind of Jesus-y, but don't usually have babies in them. (laughs) Right. Yeah, so these are an Easter classic. They're basically sweet rolls, usually with, I believe, raisins inside. She put cranberries and blueberries inside instead of raisins. Also orange zest. I think Mm. that that's pretty classic for the recipe. Usually hot cross buns have orange as well. I've had hot cross buns maybe once or twice. But I've always liked them because they're basically sweet white bread rolls, which are Mm. tasty. (laughs) I wrote down that I think Prue Leith would hate these. (laughs) Why would she hate these? I don't know. That's the vibe I got. Not enough alcohol? (laughs) Yes. I don't think jam is standard Mm -hmm. in a hot cross bun. I think that that is the added element that she put in here. And also she made the cross on top pink with freeze-dried strawberries this time. So she wasn't kidding when she said she'll make anything pink if she can. Yeah. 
for Jesus. For Jesus. <laughs> Where's the baby snow? <laughs> <laughs> this dough is remarkably wet. Wet. It's a wet dough. <laughs> But she says stick with it and it'll firm up and it seems like it did just that. Through the magic of editing. <laughs> Through the magic of time and editing. <laughs> I'd eat them. I'd eat them too. I don't know if I would put strawberry jam. I would maybe choose a different jam. Yeah. I don't know. The strawberry jam she chose looked just like one of those really, really sweet jams to me. You know, one of the like really sugary jams. I think I might choose the less sweet jam maybe. Maybe a marmalade. <laughs> oh, God, with your marmalade. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> a nice orange marmalade like Paddington. Next up, festive biscuit tower with a surprise inside. I thought this was like a British Bake Off technical challenge. Mm -hmm. It seems finicky. It seems like something where, where they'd be like, oh, we're going to stump the bakers with this recipe where you have to make concentric rings of almond cookies and make a tower out of them. <laughs> Which they had to do. Yeah. So it feels like a technical challenge to me in that way because it is literally technical. Like you have to measure and you have to make sure everything fits together. And like a lot of technical challenges, I feel like I wouldn't be that inspired to eat it. I'm like, sure, that looks fine, but it's just an almond cookie with a little bit of glaze on it. I'm not super jazzed about eating that. Yeah. First, I was like, ooh, what's the surprise inside? But then it was just like wrapped sweets. And I was like, eh. Yeah. Also not that exciting. That's not a surprise. No. <laughs> it's like uh, it's an edible pinata. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> But it's all stuff you get at the doctor's office. <laughs> uh, or in grandma's sewing box. Sewing box, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you, you, do you eat it just by like, I? she took off the top part. And then, so you just like take it layer by layer. You deconstruct it after you've constructed it. <laughs> I guess so. I will say the cookies looked softer and chewier than I expected. I thought they were going to be really hard biscotti-like cookies. Mm. So it did look better to me once they actually dug into it than I thought it was going to. But it seems like a lot of fuss and faff, as a British faff. person might say, for maybe not the most delicious end result. I do like the tip of the technique to bake them all at once, but take them out by size to, like separated by two minutes and the tip to cook everything together that's approximately the same size or weight I feel like you see that mistake on bake-off often where yeah. people put things of like wildly different sizes in the oven to cook for the exact same amount of time good tips there it's yeah you're right this last episode is a bit uninspired I'm trying to put my finger on what exactly I didn't like about it. Like I said, I liked the concept for a final episode, the premise of like, here's these very special occasion bakes. You're not going to make these every day. You're going to set aside some time to make this really special thing. And I guess the end result for all of these, for me, just weren't as impressive as I would mm -hmm. have hoped for putting so much time and effort in. We do have to talk about, lastly, Nastasia's wedding cakes. We do. Which are impressive. <laughs> but it's not something we could make. No. <laughs> no, you would have to be her to make these. <laughs> and have mountains of edible feathers. <laughs> I was like, edible feather. <laughs> and also, where's the baby? No. <laughs> where's our baby? All not wedding cakes, wedding they're cake. supposed to have babies. No. Now, this is a very beautiful wedding cake she made. It's very sculptural. She says that her background is in fashion and art, and I think that very much shows. She had a very painterly approach to mm -hmm. applying the icing to the cake, and I liked the stencil technique that she used to add texture to it. Yeah. This was definitely showing off more of a final piece and decoration than an actual beginning to end bake like we've seen in other segments and other mm -hmm. episodes i don't know how i feel about that i don't know it's just this whole episode was just kind of like 
And then these things. <laughs> I do feel like this segment did fit in with the theme well, so it mm-hmm. did have that going for it. A wedding cake is obviously a big celebration bake to make. It was interesting to see, again, with every single one of these guests, I haven't been quite inspired enough to say, check them out on Instagram or what have you. So I don't know if these segments have been totally effective for me. I did like the donuts. Yes. But um, yeah, that's the end of Nadia Bakes. That's and... the end of Nadia Bakes. That's the thing. I feel like it sort of ended not with a bang, but a whimper. But I, yeah, we'll have more to say in the mm-hmm. next episode about our overall thoughts on the whole series. Yeah. As of right now, we're going to get on over to our back burner. If you didn't know, by now, Rick and Carla are also starting a podcast. <laughs> Everyone's moving in on our territory. (laughs) Gosh, you guys, we were here first. (laughs) All the cool kids have realized how cool podcasts are. Yeah. So they announced it on their Instagram. They both have the same Instagram posts. And it sounds just like home cooking. (laughs) Yes, it is basically home cooking's premise. So they are encouraging people to call in to the podcast, leave a little voicemail, with a cooking problem that Carla and Rick can help them solve. Yeah. And if you didn't know, Home Cooking, Samin and Rishi's uh, podcast did end earlier this year. So it's not like they're competing. Right. Home Cooking was kind of only for about a year and a plan to be a limited release from the start. So I guess maybe this will fill that home cooking shaped hole in our hearts, maybe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hopefully. Yeah, I wonder which podcast network they're going to be on. I would be surprised if they were doing it independently, but they didn't mention a network, so I'm yeah. curious to know that as well. Yeah, they didn't mention a title, like nothing. This is just straight out of the box. We're doing a podcast. Send us questions. Mm-hmm. I'll definitely be checking it out. If you are looking for a new cooking show to watch, <laughs> Netflix has debuted Cooking with Paris Starring Paris Hilton, (laughs) in which any bitch can cook. (laughs) Do you remember that video that came out about a year ago that was also called Cooking with Paris when she made the lasagna? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I wonder if that was testing the water for the show, or maybe it was stuff on the cutting room floor that they repurposed. I don't know. I think she made that, and then Netflix was like, yes here's money yes please make more of these because that went super viral yeah uh so this uh show dropped on netflix on august 4th and i think i'm gonna i'm down to check it out i know people like (laughs) eye roll or whatever but i mean like i think it'll be cool and funny (laughs) yeah it looks like the simple life but in a kitchen so here are these rich and famous and supposedly glamorous people trying to make spaghetti for example <laughs> yes. it looks funny it looks campy it doesn't look like it it knows what it's doing oh, i guess yeah. is what i'm saying i i think it might be fun to check out it can have those early 2000s vibes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to our shout outs uh thank you to all those on instagram who once again were intrigued by my vegan lobster roll uh, this includes Janelle Wilk, Vibrant Visionaries, Edmonton Tourists, and Lady Pod Squad. Mrs. Casper on Twitter had a perfect summation of our <laughs> last episode and also gave us this salmonella tip. Just thought you guys should know that in baking, the salmonella comes from the flour more often than it does from the eggs. Usually, edible cookie dough skips the egg And you have to toast the flour in advance. So I stick by what I said when I said that I think eating raw eggs, the danger of it has been overblown. Eat all (laughs) the eggs. No, just kidding. (laughs) Eat all the eggs. Don't ever cook them. (laughs) (laughs) And even with what Mrs. Casper has told us, I'm still not discouraged from eating raw cookie dough Mm -mm. that I've made myself because it tastes so good. It does taste good. It's a risk I'm willing to take. <laughs> also, the Edmonton tourists let us know what a custard emergency was. She says, it's like a chocolate craving. 
You just knead it and the instant custard will work because it's fast. Similar to mug cake. It's not awesome, but it'll do in a pinch. <laughs> there you have it. Custard emergencies. Custard emergency, custard powder. These are things. I love it. And we are forever <laughs> learning. <laughs> Lastly, no review this week, but I did want to read an email we got from listener Andrea in Germany. They write in, Hi guys, I am from Germany and listen to your podcast regularly. In the latest episode, you mentioned that none of you would have considered using butter as a topping slash spread slash dip for pretzels. And I have to tell you that coming from the home country of pretzels, <laughs> butter is the best! thing you can eat on a pretzel. There is absolutely nothing better than a warm, fresh, out of the oven soft pretzel made with real lye and not baking soda with some cold butter. In fact, some bakeries here even have a special machine that pumps butter into the pretzels so they don't have to spread it on manually. So you should try it. Take care and thanks for all the work you put in the show. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. This sounds so good. It's coming from an expert. I trust them wholeheartedly. It sounds delicious. I want one of these magically, automatically butter filled pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> butter machine. I love that. <laughs> this is great. I'm imagining one of those stuffed crust pizzas you know but instead of cheese it's just butter yeah why do we stuff everything with cheese here <laughs> <laughs> literally our pretzels are stuffed with cheese that's it's true it's what is this america this blah, blah. <laughs> amazing i promise to try butter on the next soft pretzel i have and i will not but <laughs> i like hearing from you much appreciated yeah thank you Ah, uh, well, that's it for this podcast episode. Next time on the podcast, we'll be digesting the whole season of Nadia Bakes. So please write in to podappetitpodcast at gmail.com to let us know what you thought of this season. Thanks for potting with me, Meg. <laughs> yeah, thanks for potting with me and we'll digest it all soon. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you. So find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetit. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitpodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitpodcast.com. Do you read books? Do you live by small bodies of water surrounded by trees and other wildlife? Is that geese shit? If the answer to any of these questions is yes, you have found a home here at the Brook Reading Podcast. Each week, I read a book while nestled in my small New Jersey apartment and gaze out the window at a brook. Then I jump online, talk about it, ask for your opinions, and bitch about something for approximately five minutes. If you would like to join this madness, Check out the Brook Reading Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or on the Radio Public app. Let's step into some animal feces together. <laughs> <laughs>